a healthy church is a church that knows what the gospel is, proclaims the gospel, believes the gospel, preaches the gospel, and is not only trying to survive or not die out, but it's trying to thrive and, and reach more people with the gospel. I've asked around to other pastors, but they, they would all agree that we have less than five of those churches in the country. Radstock exists to equip and engage local churches to start new local churches in the world's toughest places. Find out more at radstock.org. Well, welcome to the latest Radstock Missions podcast. I'm Steve Palferman, and today I'm with uh, Pastor Gunnar Gunnarsson in his hometown of Reykjavik, Iceland. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And thanks for being willing to talk a little bit about what's going on here and uh, sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Man, I'm excited too. So um, I wanted to ask you just a little bit about what gospel ministry is like in Iceland. So I want that to be our conversation. I've watched your, uh, what was it called? Uh, Christian by Default uh, yeah, movie that you made. Yeah. Um, which is quite long actually, isn't it? So it's like a, so this is going to be briefer than that. Yeah. yeah. But that was talking about how as an, uh, as an Icelander, with the Lutheran State Church signing up for that and just being a, a kind of declared Christian but not really believing anything. Can you summarize that Yeah, for us in a few words? I mean, I, th- I think Iceland is similar to a lot of places in Europe where right. it's culturally acceptable if you claim to be a Christian, but then if you claim to believe in Christian doctrine or allow it to impact your day and day, d- day-to-day life, then you're sort of quickly uh, labeled an extremist right, okay. um, or, or a cult even Yeah, uh, when it's really historical Christianity for, you know, for the past 2,000 okay. years. And so the label Christian is okay to some. And uh, there's not a lot of hostility right now, but there's a lot of apathy. They just right. don't care. And, you know, okay, that's good. It works for you, but I, I'm, I have no interest in doing that. Right. But, um, yeah, that's sort of... What, what a lot of Christianity revolves around over here. I think one of the most shocking things about that movie was particularly people in there, young people, right? So students, 19, 20, 21 year olds, who would say, yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then you yeah. say, say, what do you believe about Jesus? And then they would say, oh no, I, I, I don't even believe he existed or something. Yeah. So, cause I wonder whether in the UK, people just would drop the Christian label altogether. I was surprised by that. Yeah, I think it's maybe something to do with the registration in the state church. Yeah. Maybe it's a cultural thing, you know. Uh, may, yeah, maybe it's just the registration in the state church. A lot of those kids, they have gone through, you know, christening classes, mm. that type of stuff, and and maybe you know, gotten baptized in the state church. And so I, I've... Because it was also the Humanist Association of Iceland did a survey here in Iceland, and they asked, are you a Christian? And there was a certain amount of percentage of them that said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Right. But then they asked the Christians, do you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And the answer was like 60% no. Okay. And so uh, out of the those who claimed to be Christians, 60% of those did not believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Now, if you start going over everything else in scripture, uh, the virgin birth, yeah, the yeah. miracles, um, or, or even what, what is sin and what is not, then you're going to definitely see those numbers shrink okay. way more uh, really fast. And so what's the church situation outside of the state church? So you guys are planting um, here in Reykjavik. Are there other evangelical churches on the island? Are there other guys preaching the gospel? Yeah, the way <clears throat> the way I describe it is this. Is if, if we put a very low threshold for what a healthy church is, mm. And we say a healthy church is a church that knows what the gospel is, proclaims the gospel, believes the gospel, and preaches the gospel. Mm. And it's not only trying to survive or not die out, but it's trying to thrive and and reach more people with the gospel. Uh, I've asked around to other pastors because I know I'm a pretty pessimistic person. Uh, But they they would all agree that we have less than five of those churches in the country. And so... Uh, there's a lot of church buildings here, mostly belonging to the state church. Right. There's also some church buildings belonging to, you know, Pentecostal churches up in, you know, out of town. Right. Uh, that have just not got a lot of, uh, people in them at all or, or no one in them. 
And so there's just not a lot of gospel witness. Tell me the story then about how your church was started and how you've come to be the pastor. And um, I, I came to faith after I had gone to three years of Bible school and after I'd done film school and was a youth pastor at that time. Okay. That's, and I was so you working. became a Christian as a youth pastor. Yeah, yeah. So that's when I first realized, well, Christianity to me for the longest time was sort of therapeutic deism. You know, okay. like I believed that Christianity was about believing that God existed and trying to be nice and sharing your toys with the other kids. And, you know, that was Christianity to me. Yeah. And so I never understood the implications of the cross, never understood, you know, I, I remember going to see The Passion of the Christ, that movie as a kid, and I was wondering, why do people call this good news? Yeah. Okay. I just saw a guy tortured for an hour. Yeah. So I never understood the implications of the cross, why I needed a savior. That happened when I was 21 and I was already a youth pastor and preaching on Sundays at least once a month. Wow. By that point. And so that kind of changed my life really quickly. Uh, the desire to start a church. Well, I, I got I got uh, saved listening to guys that were just preaching in a very different way, preaching right. exegetically, preaching uh, yeah. true scripture, Yeah, very gospel-centered, gospel-saturated. And I was looking around for churches like that. And very quickly after my conversion, the, f- the feeling came up that, well, maybe I should just start this church. Right. Which I thought was an incredibly stupid idea at the time. And it probably was at that <laughs> point. I was a new convert. Um, but then I fought that idea for about two years. And then I, I eventually got to a point where I couldn't imagine not at least giving it a try. Right. Um, and so were you very much on your own then? Or was there a team of others? How did the church come to? No. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was alone. We left the church we were at. Um, uh, I put up a Facebook status that said, we're going to start a church on Wednesday in our living room and we're going to read the gospel of John and, and pray and sing and study it. And so that's how we started. There was one other couple that came, wow. uh, Friedberg and Christine, and then my wife, Swava and our newborn, Mikhail. Right. Yeah. And what's happened since then? Cause, um, you're not still meeting in your, no, uh, we are meeting house. in homes throughout the week. Right. Um, but we are meeting right now in um, in a sc- we we moved to a school pretty quickly. Follow we've moved like every year since we planted the really? church. Yeah, so we've been all over the place. Right now we have a really good church building that we meet in, and uh, yeah, so we're we got about anywhere between thirty and fifty adults. Right, praise God, coming at 30, 30 to forty mostly, and then. 10 to 20 kids. And have you seen Icelanders become Christians through that time? Or are these people coming out of other churches? Or are they people moving to the island? Or are these people becoming Christians? What are we- no, it's it's people becoming Christians uh, right. a lot. There's some from other churches. So it's, it's a good mix of both. Um, yeah, but a, a lot may have like a story like mine where it was ma- mostly about being a nice person yeah. and believing in the existence of God and not having really great teaching. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, just just when we're recording this, these are abnormal the last two weeks, but there were two two people who came to faith. Brilliant. Seemingly, uh, at least made a confession. And, and so it's, it's happening. It's just That's a matter great. of how often, yeah. how... Uh, how you know, how often it happens so and tell us what what are the the challenges of planting a church in this kind of context so smallish island one and a half million population something like that, Is that about no right? three hundred thousand three hundred thousand three hundred and fifty thousand yeah i'm sure the guys last night were telling me it was more than that really maybe they're including the tourists how yeah many, maybe how many tourists do you get we're getting about i think close to three million a year right now okay yeah Wow. So 300,000 on the island, so it's like a small city, really. Yeah. Um, what, what have been the challenges for you? Uh, I've learned that Icelanders value consistency a lot. So no one really took our church seriously or me as a pastor to be a real pastor seriously up until maybe two years ago, okay. like three years into a, the journey. Yeah, they were yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. They're, they're here to stay. Uh, yeah. They're, they're serious stay about this. Yeah. yeah. And so that was one thing. And what, uh, what changed then? So what would it look like for people to take you seriously? It was just more of 
um, like our church being a place where you could genuinely go to. Okay. And, you know, when when you would hear the Christian community talk about churches to go to, like, well, yeah. yeah. And, and then maybe you lost the one, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, like okay. maybe there, but, the, but it, it was just, I, I, it was more of the attitude of the people. It, it right. feel, felt like, yeah. Um, so it wasn't like something tangible it was more as like, yeah, just more of something you felt from the people um, that came over time. And I've realized that more and more right now, just the importance of consistency. Right. And so that was really difficult the first year. You uh, can't short circuit that, can you? The only way to get that yeah, is by... Just staying. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we just started and we were we had started Sunday services at, the, at this point, you know, and we we were meeting on in december it was super dark it's like four hours of sunlight mm-hmm. super depressing to live through december here in iceland sometimes um Friedberg and christine the couple that joined us to yeah, yeah. to sort of start the church they had just had a baby and there was three services in a row where it was just like me my wife and Mika. really like, just the three of us on a dark sunday evening uh trying to like okay we just keep going keep yeah. going and sure enough god has been God has been gracious and brilliant. And, and do you, uh, in terms of evangelism and reaching people, how how are you doing that? What's the thing that you found the most effective way of communicating the gospel with Icelanders? Right now, it's reminding our church that every single member of our church is a missionary. Right. Not thinking of the people we pray for on Sundays somewhere else, yeah. you know, in other countries as the missionaries. We're all ambassadors of christ in our daily lives yeah. and so seeing them take that reality and run with it has been yeah. awesome yeah awesome to see um uh, you know even when it costs them uh to to run with that and take that reality and so that's been awesome we've done a few things uh we have a university ministry now right they have a bible study group there on campus and and they've sort of become the uh, this drawing point from a lot of people from atheist agnostics to Muslims and others coming to join them for movie nights. Right. Uh, during uh, the season, they were having American football evenings on Sunday evenings. And so it's it's been very cool to see them be a salt and light into their communities, right. gather a lot of unbelievers around them, but also share the gospel with them. And, and what, have you, what have you used to encourage? Because I, like, I feel like... Every member of the church being a missionary is is what we all yeah. long for and aim for, isn't it, as a church? I know, I know I stand up in our church members' meetings often and will say, you know, I hope you guys realize that the evangelistic strategy of the church is you guys speaking to other people about Jesus. Yeah. And there's a sort of, ha ah, terror on their faces. How, what, have you, what have you done to, to help build that kind of culture? Because that's a... That's a tough yeah. to build. You know what? I've been trying to think about it. It's, <laughs> it's um, well, what, what I've tried to do is trying to find my strengths and try to use them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to me, not a lot of people feel comfortable about talking in front of a lot of people yeah. about the faith. And so I've just said I'm going to be faithful. And I've shared my, like what I'm trying to do to, yeah. to share the gospel with people. You know, so when uh, the University of, of uh, there's a university of the arts, I guess you would okay. call it. Uh, they invited me and uh, sort of grilled me for an hour and a half on questions with re- regards to Christianity. Cause they were about to write a script on a play out of a story in the Bible. And they, yeah. and so they got our former mayor of Reykjavik to be the atheistic side and me being the Christian side. And so I've just sort of been open. I've told my people like if, if I will take whatever opportunity I get to preach the gospel, and just so you know, if you if you see me at a conference with some weird teaching going on, you know, I told you this before, yeah. I'm going to take the opportunity to preach the gospel and correct if I need to. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to use every opportunity. And so I've just been tr- faithful trying to do videos because I know how to do videos. Yeah, and I'm yeah. just thinking, what do I have that I can use to get the gospel out there? Maybe that's helped. Yeah. Um, I also think it's just a community of people because you right. you get to a point where you know this person is like the, the, the entire church is praying for her friend, friend, yeah, you know, and and then you have then you have just the, the entire church kind of making room for that in their brains. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of maybe 
similar to when you're buying a car okay. and all of a sudden you start you know, like it's a Toyota Avensis or something. And then you, all of a sudden when you're thinking about that car for the first time, you start seeing that everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Because you've made like sort of a compartment in your brain. So yeah. maybe that too, just the fact that the entire church is talking about that one friend, then yeah. they start thinking, oh, what friend want, do yeah, I yeah, have? I and so, um, yeah, I th- but I've always hammered away at, at the, the book of Acts too, that it's not really centralized. It's a couple of guys walking down yeah, the street sure, yeah. and meeting someone, yeah, yeah. sharing the gospel with them. Yeah. It's not like a, a crusade. Yeah. Right? It's two guys being yeah. intentional. Um, have you done anything to more specific to to train members in in that? Is there a? Um, I guess I'm thinking, what are the common objections that they would get from their work colleagues? Yeah, yeah. You know, say so if if I've if I'm a member of the State Lutheran Church and I call myself a Christian but don't believe in the resurrection, yeah. Um, I you know I think oh well, all the gospels have, they've just been changed. You yeah. Know, do you do you equip church members to answer those kind of questions? Do you. Yeah, I mean, we've got that. good books. Uh, we've got, I also try to teach during sermon times. Like yeah. I'll take, you know, for instance, we're, we're walking our way through Daniel right now. Yeah. There's a lot of specific prophecy there. Yeah. And I know what they teach in the University of Iceland in the, in the theolo- theological department. I know it's very, you know, it's written after the fact. It's written as history and yeah, not prophecy. Yeah. And so, you know, I took a whole Sunday off just to give the case defending Daniel yeah. from a historical perspective, linguistic perspective. And for a lot of churches, they probably wouldn't do that. But I know no. a lot of those conversations are going to come up. Yeah. Um, That's great. And it's the assu- when I'm preaching, it's the assumption that my members are going to have to communicate what they've learned to yeah. their non-Christian friends. So that's going to shape how I teach yeah. the scriptures. Yeah. And you like you go into Daniel 10, it's talking about Michael the Archangel. And one yeah. of the things that we have here is Jehovah's Witnesses. Right. Okay. What do they believe about Michael the Archangel? That he is the supreme being. He's the only Archangel. And then you read Daniel 10 and it's like, no, he's one of few. Yeah, yeah. And so it's also just stopping saying, hey, if you meet a Jehovah's Witness, this would be a good passage to turn to. Right. Uh, you know, to to talk about. Um, and so we also do doubt nights. What We do once a month. Last Friday of the month, we go to a cafe or a bar downtown and we say, if you're wanting to come and ask any questions about the faith, we're going to open up with a specific question in mind and then we're going to open it up to to the floor. Yeah. Fantastic. And so we've done that twice now. We just started that this year and we're hoping that it equips the Christian to answer those questions better, but it also gives them opportunity to bring their friends who they may not feel like, oh, these questions are too deep for me. Let me. Yeah. And so. So that's worked well the last Great. couple of – and then we, we film like I do Apologia where I deal with questions about the okay. faith. So um, that's in Icelandic and then the, the, the English version of that because our church is split between Icelandic speakers and English speakers. Right. And so the English version of that would be the Stranded Baptist. Yeah. And so I'm going to okay. try to give materials to our people on how to answer that's, a specific yeah. question. And tell us then – what can we be praying for? What, what's your hopes and dreams for the future for um, for your church, for the island? Um, I would ask you to pray for us that we set a good foundation for the others to build on. Mm. I feel like there wasn't really a baton between the generations to hand off. You've, you kind of have to pick it up a floor. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's very little infrastructure for leadership yeah. development, yeah. for seminary training, for theological training, uh, books, resources in Icelandic. There's very little that we can sort of take and run with. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of groundwork to be covered, and so we're praying that we would God would allow us to be that. And my prayer for Iceland is 250 healthy churches in the next hundred years. Uh, but I know that's ridiculous to most people. And, right. and that's why I kind of like the prayer. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If it happens in a hundred years, then God would definitely be glorified through that. Absolutely. Not, and it's uh, not a prayer you're going to get to see whether yeah, it's answered or not. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But yeah. that also helps us focus on the mission of, of not just seeing our church grow, but seeing the kingdom of God grow yeah. and seeing disciples made. And, and we need to figure out like 250 churches. Okay, that's the goal. It's kind of like the moon landing. It's like yeah. we're going up there. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. it's just how do we get there? Yeah, yeah. And so it's, you know, 250 churches, what's got to happen? We got to, you know, do leadership yeah. development. And that's some classes I'm working on right now for yeah. our people. 
And the Iceland project, that's trying to get a wider group of people involved in that. Yeah, and the Iceland that. project is dedicated to not just our church. It's yeah. only been us up, up until this point. Um, but now it's going to, Logan and Carla are coming over here to start Redeemer Reykjavik City Church. Okay. Uh, and then hopefully we get more and more people. And so that's the umbrella for all. It's what I hope the IMB, the International Mission Board for Iceland. Okay. Yeah. Is the of, Iceland project. Where we can help the, the guys do ministry on the ground and just focus on ministry and sort have it kind of centralized to just send money your way and just focus on doing your thing. Yeah, okay. Um, instead of feeling like you have to uh, you know, keep... There's some of the kind of groundwork that you can do for yeah, those people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing your story. It's really, really fascinating. Will we... I keep praying for you. Thank you. Thank you.